<laughs> we're excited for another bit of chemistry today, everyone. Woo! Uh, so what we're going to do today, ladies, gents, girls, boys and others, plan for today is to have a look at evidence for a changing atmosphere. So, right, last time uh, that we actually had a session like this, we were... Uh, looking at how the atmosphere has changed over a period of time and you guys came up with, and girls and others uh, came up with some really nice storyboards uh, and those storyboards were made using different resources including the video featuring James uh, and the Brian Cox video as well there were some lovely videos going on there uh, and those resources were looking absolutely lovely but you all just believed it you all just went yep that sounds about right. Uh, Miss Bateson is saying it, therefore it must be true. Nobody really questioned uh, the idea that how do we actually know that those theories are true? How do we actually know? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. You are very, very welcome um, to just listen to this and then write it up later, or you can do it as you go. Um, but don't feel like you have to scribble this all down very quickly now. It is all good. OK, so how do we actually know that the atmosphere has changed over time? And what evidence do we have to support this? Has anyone had any good ideas on this? Because uh, this was posted on Edmodo last night for you to have a think about. So some people have talked about uh, fossils, using fossils of it as evidence. Yeah, that's great. Carbon dating, ice cores and tree rings. Well done. Great evidence. Uh, carbon dating dinosaurs. Ah, fantastic. Geography has already talked about ice cores. Great. Um, we are going to have a look at ice cores um, as part of this lesson as well. Uh, so, so those of you who've done it in geography, sorry about that. You're going to have it again. Um, but yeah, great, super duper duper. Yeah, some great ideas coming in here. Uh, some silly suggestions as well. So some people have suggested time travel or really, 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 really old people. Uh, now, the time that we were talking about um, was millions and billions of years ago. So it was kind of, there's nobody that old. Uh, the Bible, the Bible said so. No, the Bible did not say so. What we're going to do today is look at these different pieces of evidence uh, and it's kind of up to you how you summarise this. So last time I kind of gave you a bit of creative freedom and, and it was a really great thing because some of the things you came up with was absolutely gorgeous. Feel free, since we have got these laptops to do things with at the minute, feel free to go crazy with it. If you want to make some like, uh, if you've heard of Prezi before, Prezi is great. Uh, somebody was telling me about something called like Glenda or something. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, you can Python it, You whatever you like. Okay, you taking control of this and having this as your sort of project um, is much more sort of deeper learning than me just going, this is this, that is that. So uh, the title for today's lesson is up there, uh, Evidence for a Changing Atmosphere. And just like we have in lesson, uh, there is a yellow box there. So if you do want to do it sort of how we would do in lesson of just writing things down as we go, that's fine as well. So don't feel like you have to scribble it all down very, very quickly now. You can if you want, but you don't have to. Um, can I make a funny, fully animated project using my stupidly powerful PC? Yes, you can. That would be awesome. And I'd be really happy to see that. That'd be really, really cool. Um, in the past, when we've done this in a lesson, hola, uh, what I've done with students is uh, get a A4 piece of paper and fold it. into three sections here. Origami, it still happens. Um, so here's one I prepared earlier, ladies, gents. Oop, let's get that back. So there we are. So A4 piece of paper, fold that back into the middle and fold that bit over. Uh, if you don't do it perfectly, I know some of you get a bit OCD about these things, uh, there will be a bit of an overlap. But actually, I think the overlap looks kind of cool because you could do like a little title there. Uh, introduction on the front and then maybe we're doing about three main pieces of evidence so you can have the first piece of evidence there second evidence third evidence however realistically 
it's completely up to you. You represent this however you like. You have, as I keep saying, creative freedom. So go for it. Make something cool or just make something functional. It is completely up to you. Another nice message has come through. Uh, I downloaded that game. There is another called Star Walk. It's quite cool. Yeah, uh, I posted on Enmodo um, uh, an app. I can't remember what it's called now. I've got it on my phone. Uh, Terra Genesis. There we go. I've been playing it on and off for donkey's years. Um, it's free, but you can sort of download extra bits and pay for extra bits if you really want. Um, I've never bothered. Uh, and it just talks about what we call uh, terraforming or terragenesis. And all that is, is the idea of transforming other planets to a similar atmosphere to ours, um, which, you know, if we screw up the Earth too bad and we have to go to somewhere else, that's going to be necessary. But uh, hopefully it's not. Hopefully we actually learn not to destroy our ill own planet but yeah terra genesis is a great game um, and they've got some really cool ideas uh, and sequestration that we talked about last time is mentioned in that as well um, along with all sorts of different uh, really cool techniques about changing the atmosphere and the composition and the pressure and things like that right anyway let's crack on with this so the evidence that we're talking about um yes we're talking about uh like rocks and fossils and really 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 old things and some of you have talked about um ice cores as well so some of the people in the live comments have mentioned ice cores being covered in gcse geography which is absolutely super so we have got what we call a cross-curricular link here before we get too much into the evidence um i do just want to give a shout out to people doing uh, science jobs and even when we're in school the government was always saying oh you need to do more to tell people about what types of jobs there are in science because what most people assume is that anyone doing science kind of is just going to look like that they're going to be stuck inside um, just all day messing about with computers and machines which in itself is quite fun to be quite honest I mean look at them that little happy couple there, they, well, they might not be a couple, um, but look at them, they're, they're pretty happily away doing their science, she's even got some sort of tablet there, good times. So yeah, um, when it comes to careers in science, so this at the top here says careers in STEM, that's uh, science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, so yeah, you can just be sat working in a lab as a scientist, there's a hell of a lot of scientists right now doing that. Um, virologists, pathologists, doctors, um, researchers, that we are depending on them right now uh, to do a heck of a lot of these different things. Um, but you don't necessarily just have to do sitting in a lab to have a job as a scientist. So uh, I can't remember who it was that told me. Um, I want to say it was one of Mr. Bateson's friends from university or something like that, um, whatever. Um, but I knew a person who uh, did biology as a degree at university and they specialised in marine biology and they are now working on a, in Australia um, on the Gold Coast looking at the coral reef and they go scuba diving every day. They don't get up until like 10 in the morning um, and then they go diving and then they have a barbecue on the beach. And then they get to see some really cool animals at the same time, which is absolutely awesome. As a job, I didn't even know that was a thing. Have a look, there's all sorts of jobs in science. So just literally type in careers in STEM, uh, marine biologist. This here is a, a video. Well, it's, it's a picture that I screen grabbed from a video. And this woman is doing something pretty cool. It's liquid nitrogen and yes someone's guessed it is that an ice cream parlor yes it is okay so what this lady is doing is she's pouring cream into liquid nitrogen and it's setting and it's making ice cream um when i was at university we did actually do this uh, a lady came in oh no sorry it was a guy came in um for a special course it was just an evening course uh, and it was called culinary chemistry and what they basically did is brought along a load of sciencey stuff to do with the food industry. Uh, and they made liquid nitrogen ice cream for us. And they showed us all sorts of really cool stuff. Um, so, yeah, I, I discovered just after getting onto my teacher training course that there is such a job as being an ice cream scientist. That is a real job, ladies and gents. You can be an ice cream scientist. So just as I was finishing 
let's say my chemistry degree, between my chemistry degree and my teacher training degree, I discovered there was such a thing as an ice cream scientist. Uh, and then the day after, one of my lecturers came in and said that uh, the university was sponsoring a PhD. So that's an additional qualification. That's a, you get to be called doctor, whatever you are. Um, they were doing a PhD in the aeration of chocolate. So putting more bubbles in chocolate and it was sponsored by Nestle. So Nestle were basically paying our university uh, to find a way to make more aero bubbles. Yeah, yummy. Um, so careers in science, yeah, it's not necessarily about just sitting in a lab like that. You could be out in the water doing some marine biology. You could be making some sort of weird and wonderful new food. Um, or, and this is where we get back to the atmosphere. So one or two of you are going, when are you going to talk about the atmosphere? Now, now I'm going to talk about the atmosphere. This person here. Uh, this again, this is a scientist, this is a real job that you can get. Uh, this guy is with the French Polar Institute and he is uh, checking out an ice core. Now there is a specific name for what he is, ice biologist. That is a good idea. Um, this person, uh, and some of you have actually, obviously you can't pronounce it because I've got you all on mute. Um, <laughs> Lots of people are typing it. Yeah, I know, it's really easy. But what some people are doing on the comments here are exactly what I would always suggest you do when you're presented with an unusual world, is break it into the different sections. So a paleontologist, paleo refers to something that's very, very, very old. So paleo, like paleontology, they, just, uh, they uh, study fossils. Climate is the weather. An ologist is somebody who studies something. So a paleoclimatologist, it's a scientist who studies the ancient climate. So paleoclimatologist. Yes, well done. Paleoclimatologist. Okay, so this is a real job that people can actually do. And the function of the paleoclimatologist, there's a whole different range of them, uh, some specialising in different sections. So some will look more at ice cores, some will look at fossil sort of stuff. Um, there's variations within that field itself. They study the history of the Earth's climate. And it does go back, yes, thousands of years, but more likely to millions of years. And all scientists, but especially the paleoclimatologists, they must use as much evidence as possible. It shows it is repeatable. It shows it is reliable. These are the words that we like. Um, so people can't disprove their theory, yes? If they've not got theory, um, that people won't believe them. But yeah, it's very important for scientists to use as much evidence as possible Basically, so it's less likely that they're going to be disproved, okay? Yes, reliable, yes, accurate, yes, all those buzzwords that we're going to use all the time in science, but it's to make sure that, yet yeah, we get the actual result that's actually true and to sort of prove that it wasn't just, oh, one piece of evidence that can be disproved. So it would be very harsh of me to say, maybe from one class, I might say, from the top set year 10s, all year 10 boys are loud and silly. Would that be fair? Ugh, fair, wrong word. Would that be valid? No, it wouldn't be valid at all because first off, most of the people uh, in that top set are absolutely lovely. There's one or two of you cheeky sausages who are a little bit noisy. To make a statement based on one very small sample of data is quite frankly irresponsible, okay? And we are actually seeing a lot of that at the minute in the media. Um, where they've got, got one piece of evidence and from one piece of evidence, someone said it here, uh, there's no sweeping statements. Yeah, completely. It's very easy for people to look at evidence and go, oh, that means that Corona beer gives you coronavirus. What's your evidence for that? Well, it's named it and, and, and China are no longer shipping it in and they used to always ship it in and now they haven't any, like, just nonsense, okay? You need as much evidence as possible and the evidence must be peer reviewed that means another scientist another scientist or another group of scientists has to repeat that experiment using the same variables talking about validity there and get the same result okay 
So it's all about ensuring the validity of your data and making sure it is reproducible. Here we go. Here's another theory at the minute. Uh, COVID-19 is created by 5G. Give me some evidence for that. Like really just uh, my days. OK, so getting as much evidence as possible, backing it up, making sure your results are reproducible by a different group of people using your same variables. If it still shows to be true, then great. It probably is. OK. So let's have a look at each of these different pieces of evidence. You've probably heard of the idea that um, the tree ring shows you how old a tree is. It's not necessarily as, as plain as, oh, that's definitely one year's growth. It, it kind of represents one year's growth, it, but it more, it describes a season more, more than a like specific, like 365 days, it shows the seasons of growth. So you can see in this diagram here that the tree rings vary in thickness. So it's specified that this bit here is one year's worth of growth. And here it's quite dark and thin, and that shows small cells formed in autumn. Now, why might the cells be smaller in autumn? The growth rate is linked to the conditions, whether it be uh, temperature, water, availability of nutrients, availability of light. So we're linking it to photosynthesis there. The different thicknesses and the different sort of shades that we are seeing are linked to how good the conditions are for that tree at that time. So we can use tree rings to tell us kind of the history of the weather. As we can see there, there is a new layer of wood each year and the thicker the ring is, the better the growing conditions. So if we're thinking good growing conditions for plants, we're talking about lots of sunlight, um, plentiful water, but not enough for it to sort of drown, I suppose would be the word, um, to oversaturate itself and to get it sort of rotting or anything like that. And potentially like no pollutants as well. So let's say if there were lots of uh, volcanic emissions nearby or factories or some source of pollution nearby, whether it be synthetic or naturally occurring pollution, um, if there was a lot of pollution around at that time, the tree would not grow quite as well. Uh, someone's just asked here, is that how we worked out when uh, Krakatoa erupted? Um, I honestly don't know off the top of my head, but that probably would be a really, really good source of evidence, actually, the trees nearby when that volcano erupted. Yeah, they would have stunted growth for that year. Now, problem though. Can anyone see a problem with using this as a source of evidence? Uh, so what everyone's doing, uh, unreliable, not repeatable, yeah, <laughs> um, not repeatable, definitely. The big problem with the tree rings is you have to cut down the tree to get it. So if you're cutting down the tree, that's not particularly good because that's going to damage our atmosphere as well because you're going to, you're removing something that removes carbon dioxide. Now, yes, the trees can be hundreds, thousands of years old, and you're de destroying a living thing that has been around for hundreds and thousands of years. So that's not good. Um, if the animal's using it as a habitat, again, you're destroying a habitat there. It might be an ecosystem built around the different trees. It's just, it's not good. Uh, someone's saying, I thought they just drilled through the trees. Yes, they can do. They don't necessarily have to chop it all the way down. Um, but the only problem is with drilling into a tree, again, you're, you're damaging the tree. If you don't do it correctly, the tree will die anyway. So especially if any sort of uh, little organism in there, so like termites or bugs, or it, it's not the best. So even if you don't chop the tree down, you are potentially gonna kill the tree or at very minimum do a bit of damage to it that it might take it a bit of time to recover from. So in terms of evidence, it's not, particularly good it's good at showing us different things um it doesn't necessarily quantify 
it's not giving us an exact percentage of different things it's just showing us roughly good growing conditions bad growing conditions okay next piece of evidence then coral um coral is really 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 cool um, there are different types of coral and the different variations of different species and subspecies um, work in slightly different ways. Um, actually, the last time I was at the deep in Hull uh, with my daughter, there was a person there actually doing a presentation about it. And I wanted to stick around and listen, um, but Cassie wanted to go and see the penguins. <laughs> So what coral basically is, uh, again, some of the different species, uh, it's it's a bit of an animal organism with plant-like abilities as well. Now, I'm not going to go into all that thing because that's biology sort of stuff. But basically what it is, is a little organism that makes itself kind of like a little, little house around it. So this bit down here is going to be uh, predominantly calcium carbonate CaCO3 um, because what the little organism does is it absorbs calcium and carbon dioxide converts that into calcium carbonate and builds up a little layer around it and to make itself bigger all that it'll do is spit out another little layer and then it'll grow another little layer and maybe another little layer and oh I fancy having a, an extension on the loft there oh yeah no the kids need a bedroom upstairs okay and it grows bigger and bigger and it becomes the coral. Now, as I said, the little organism absorbs, yes, these elements from the sea, so it might absorb any calcium that's there, it will absorb carbon dioxide, which it then converts into the calcium carbonate, but it'll also absorb anything else from around the oceans as well. Now, there is what we call, and as we said last time, an equilibrium, a balance between what is in the air and what is in the sea. What we get happening is whatever is stuck up in the air is in a balance with what is in the ocean. So if there's more carbon dioxide in the air, there's more carbon dioxide in the ocean. Let's say that there's a, uh, a volcanic eruption and it gives off lots of sulfur dioxide, lots of sulfur dioxide in the air, lots of sulfur dioxide will get absorbed into the ocean. Now these then further break down or react with other chemicals um, to make hydrogen carbonate. And this can break down to form sulfuric acid. Now, the problem that we are getting with these things, which is a slight bit of a tangent, uh, is something called coral bleaching because both of these are acidic in nature so therefore they are slowly making the oceans more and more acidic and these little uh, corals and other organisms here are very very sensitive to different conditions so this has two effects first off whatever is in the sea when they are forming their new layers let's say there was lots of sulfur dioxide, is actually going to get absorbed into that layer. Let's say uh, for this one down here, there was lots of carbon dioxide around at that point. Maybe there was lots of lead there, okay? And the different chemicals build up in the different layers at different times. And basically, the ones at the bottom are the old bits, the bits at the top are new of coral trap what is ever in the sea at the time okay so each of these will have different chemicals trapped in there which we can harvest a little bit of it we can harvest a little bit of it and then use it again later some people are saying do we have to copy the coral diagram you don't have to but if it helps you understand it and it helps inform your notes then yeah i'd, I'd suggest doing so and people are already suggesting disadvantages of this as well. So well done to those. Uh, disadvantage, uh, I'm just gonna read this straight out. A disadvantage of coral is that reefs are endangered. So we won't be able to use this evidence anymore. Very true, thank you for that. Really no, uh, a nice another comment coming in now. It's a very delicate ecosystem. Yeah, so not necessarily just damaging the coral itself, but all the other animals in um, the food web with that organism as well. A very delicate ecosystem, so small changes can affect the whole coral reef. That's true. 
here's just a very quick overview of what we were saying there. So the larger the coral, the older it is. The lower down on the coral it is, the older it is as well. The top layers are the newest. It creates a record of the sea conditions in little layers that they call bands. And each of those bands have different chemicals absorbed into them based on the chemicals that were in the sea at that time. Coral bleaching, as it says here at the bottom, coral bleaching is a real issue. Again, um, if you go to the deep in Hull, obviously it's probably closed right now, um, but when it's open, uh, they've got a really nice little exhibit about this because coral bleaching is a problem. I said before that coral is kind of plant, kind of animal, and the sort of plant parts of it, they can do photosynthesis. Yay, photosynthesis, great process. However, when there's too much acid built up in the ocean, what will happen is these, this acid will react with the uh, chlorophyll and the other bits needed for photosynthesis and they bleach it. Okay, and bleaching it, if you are destroying the chlorophyll, the chlorophyll is responsible for absorbing the energy uh, and therefore you cannot do the photosynthesis. And if you can't do photosynthesis, it can't get energy. If it doesn't have energy, it dies. So sad times for the little corals and all the organisms that live there. So as a source of evidence, corals, yes, it can tell us the chemicals. Um, we can actually, as opposed to the tree rings, um, within the coral, what we can do is each band, we can extract a section of that band and do uh, what we call quantitative chemical tests on it to tell specifically what chemicals are there rather than just, oh, there must have been pollution because this one hasn't grown particularly well. You can go, oh no, there's a high quantity of sulfur in that layer. That might be linked to sulfur dioxide. And you could even um, potentially work out the concentration and then scale that up to get an exact number. A uh, few co questions coming in, let's have a look. Uh, why do they bleach them? Um, it, that's a really complicated question. Uh, the short answer is just the acid burns it. Um, that's all we need at this level, so that'll do. If coral works by photosynthesis, would coral theoretically be able to live outside of water? Theoretically, yes, but they have been, they have evolved over a hell of a long period of time to survive in water. So they will probably need that water to maintain like cell diffusion and water osmosis, biology words. Um, wouldn't you need only really old coral to tell? Yes, you would. How do we know what chemicals the coral has absorbed? Uh, you take a sample, you react it with chemicals, depend on what the reaction does, that will tell you what it is. Uh, in year 11, we're gonna do more about that. Uh, quantitative, yes, we call these quantitative tests. Um, and the quantitative means uh, that we measure it in numbers. It's a large idea of saying that. And one or two people have said this as well, but it's just come up again. Uh, can we pour alkalis into the water to neutralize the acid? Uh, that is a really good suggestion. However, the uh, practicalities of doing that, it's pretty damn dangerous. So alkalis that would be strong enough to do that, um, you don't want to be messing around with. And again, because the oceans are huge, um, you'd have to get the alkali to spread out really quickly and really well, uh, which as yet, we've not found a good way of doing that. Uh, right, okay. Tree rings, done. Coral, done. Ice cores. So ice cores, uh, the Arctic. So we were looking for something that's been around for a long period of time. Trees have been along for a period of time. Um, coral's been around for donkey's years. Things that have been around even longer and untouched by people because, you know, we are screwing up our trees, we are screwing up our oceans. Uh, you can argue that we're screwing up the uh, uh, poles as well. But the layers of ice in the Arctic, the deeper down you go, um, the older it is and the less likely it is to be disturbed by humans and human activity. So. Actually, 
this is one of the main bits of evidence that they use to actually discuss and to research um, the conditions of the atmosphere millions of years ago. Because we've seen that water will absorb whatever is in the atmosphere. What is snow? What is ice? Ice and snow is just water, okay? So before it froze, it will have absorbed whatever was in the atmosphere, and then it settles, it freezes, another layer builds on top of it, and therefore it is stored safe and secure where we haven't been able to mess with it. So this diagram sums it up really nicely here. So this representation shows sort of the rock, like the crust of the earth, okay? And this is the top layer where we're at. And you drill down and they get a sample of ice and they pick it up. And you can see from this little picture here, they can actually see different things in it. So it might be that there's little bits of algae stored there, showing that those may be plants around at that point. If there was plant matter in an ice core, that shows again good growing conditions. We can link it back to our tree rings here. If you get your sample, and let's say this section of sample here comes out as being very acidic, we might be able to say, well, there's probably a lot of carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide there because they react with water to form carbonic acid and sulfuric acid. Let's say uh, this one up here looks quite dark, doesn't it? So maybe that one has got lots of volcanic ash stored in it. Okay, so what they actually do is take little sections out and analyze it. They can do repeats because they only use a tiny bit of sample at a time and they store all of these in freezing temperatures and they have these massive containers where they keep them all. Now, what I'm going to do at this point is there are other videos that I can show you based on this. Um, there's other things that we can talk about as plants doing these things as well. But for now, what I'm going to do is we're going to leave it there. We've gone over the three main types of uh, evidence that you need for that. Okay, there we go. So what do you lot need to do? What you need to do is have made something showing these three main types of evidence. It is up to you what that something looks like. It can be a little leaflet with different sections for each piece of evidence. It can be just lines in the textbook, in your exercise book rather. Um, it can be some sort of animation. We are writing, in this case, writing to inform. Let's link what we know to English. Uh, so informative language here, statistics, data, things like that. Uh, and someone said, can I have it copied up just as you've said it? Yeah, that is completely fine. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna set on Edmodo, uh, this is an assignment to finish probably for Thursday, okay? Once again, I'm not actually going to collect these in. I don't need to see a copy, neither do your other teachers, okay? But if you want to send us a copy to get some brownie points, go for it. That'd be really cool. Uh, on Edmodo, we can actually send you badges for achievement. So if you want to earn yourself some badges, go for it. Um, it is due, I think, on Thursday. I will double check that. But yeah, let's go for Thursday. And what we'll do on Thursday in the webinar, we will review a little bit of this. And then what we'll do is talk about gases in the atmosphere at the minute uh, and how we actually know what they are at the minute as well. And at the end of the week on Friday, I will release uh, a quiz on Edmodo just to assess what you have learned from this so far. OK. I am going to stay online just for a few more minutes because I know lots of people was had questions about it. Joe what are you doing Joe you are summarizing what we've discussed today as a leaflet as a poster as a powerpoint however you want you just need to have written about those three main pieces of evidence do you have to do all the evidence types or just one uh, just those three please so tree rings coral and the ice cores PowerPoint on file store. Yes, I can, but the file store has been being a bit iffy recently, so I will send it out on Edmodo. Our webinar on Thursday is going to be um, 12, uh, well, 12.30 till 2, but I think I'll probably do it at 1 
if that's okay with you lot. Uh, do you have to do any other research? You don't have to, uh, but if you want to, you're very welcome to. Well, if I wanted to do a degree in astrophysics, would I have to take chemistry and physics at A-level? Definitely physics. Um, I'd probably go maths as well. And I mean, I personally, with that combination, would go for chemistry just because there's a lot of overlap with the chemistry anyway. Uh, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be chemistry to do astrophysics. But physics and maths, you definitely have to do for astrophysics. Years ago, when are we back in school? Pfft. Never. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, I honestly don't know. For now, I'm just going to keep going with this and see how we go. What A-levels do you need to get a degree for ice cream science? Uh, it's, it's one of those that you don't need specific things, um, but a science background is, is a definitely good way to go. Uh, so if you were aiming to be an ice cream scientist, uh, I would definitely go for chemistry um, because that is culinary chemistry is a section of that. Uh, so chemistry, probably biology, because we could talk about like digestion and things like that um biology and chemistry and then another option that you like um, maths again is a good combo with that but then equally anything else that takes you fancy do i earn any money from youtube nope not a penny um for you to get money monetization i think it's called on youtube you've got to have over a thousand subscribers um i don't have over a thousand subscribers i've got about 250 which for me is like whoa that's a lot um uh, it's not something i'm really interested in uh, i'm not doing this for the money i'm doing this to help you lot and if it happens to help some other people along the way great um are you available 24 7 on edmodo and email in theory yes uh but in practice as i keep saying i have got a three-year-old four cats one hamster and mr bateson um so home life is pretty busy uh so please do not be offended and don't be worried uh if you don't hear back from me straight away because i'm probably having to run around dressed as a dinosaur with my toddler who's dressed as a pumpkin. Um, that's just the reality of my life. Um, or I might have, here we go, I don't know if you can see this, or I might have gone cycling with my daughter and stopped for ice cream and other essentials, only essentials. <laughs> Should we email you at 2 a.m. then for a quick, quick response? Uh, Go for it. Go for it. If you want to do that, that's fine. Lovely hearing from you all. Bye bye. Have fun. Be good. Don't eat too much chocolate. Drink lots of water. Wash your hands.